So what we're gonna do with just a few minutes remaining of our time is I thought it would be great to have the Dean of the Friedman School, Dari Mazafarian, join me. And Dari and I, you know, what I'd like to do is just have a little bit of reflection. And then also there were some audience questions that came up that we didn't get to that I think might be really great to reflect on and ones that uh, you would be particularly good at, at reflecting on as well. So uh, before I get into those, you know, what are, do you have some, you know, high level reflections and thoughts you'd, you'd like to share? Well, I think the, the scope and scale of the challenges, um, it, you know, in terms of addressing what we have to address in, in the food system, in terms of the challenges for, for um, you know, actually creating companies, creating customer bases, creating social movements, are only matched by the scope of the problem. So, so you know, it's it's if this was incredibly hard and complicated, and we were going to get a little bit of bang for our, for our effort, you know, we'd all give up and go home. But but you know, this is I think the greatest overall single issue facing you know humanity today is how we're going to fix the food system, whether it's for nutrition and access and nutrition security or for sustainability um, uh, or or for equity, and. It has to be, the private sector has to be, you know, the biggest part of the solution with supportive government policies and, and other, other, other things. But if it's not economically, um, uh, you know, um, sustainable, it's not going to work. And, and, so, and so I think that's kind of my overall reflection is we covered a lot of ground about the, the challenges for communication and miscommunication and how to get it right. Uh, but, you know, even small incremental steps toward getting it right can have huge positive impacts for human health and, and for health of the planet. Yeah, 100%. You know, uh, I was really struck in the beginning, I think Tambra's comment about trust and, and Corby's point about pulling that out was really important um, as we look through this. And, and one of the questions that came up that kind of ties in with trust and is a topic that you're very good at, at speaking to is the role of our healthcare system. And the question was around a few things. One was when, a, when someone's a patient in the healthcare system, even in a hospital being given food, you know, how are these standards gonna matriculate over to a healthcare system that becomes the place we trust, we go to to be well, and can kind of cut through all the, the crazy information out there for us. You know, share with us, share with us, where was that going? <laughs> how do we do that? Well, I think the healthcare system is is crucial to this, and you know this was this was mentioned by by Josh, uh, you know about about leveraging the power and dollars of the healthcare system. If we want to fix food, there's three big places where all the money is, and so the money is in healthcare, the money is in nutrition assistance programs, whether they're they're government or or philanthropy, and the money is in business. And so those are the three big buckets for intervention. And all of them need the foundation of good science and trusted, credible science, which is where academic institutions and research and education uh, come into play. But so healthcare is one of the three big buckets we absolutely have to be sure that food is integrated into. And there's been a lot done on this and a lot of advances in the United States. And this is the one area actually where I would say the United States is really truly leading the way in food systems innovation. Um, you know, there's there's others probably maybe cellular ag, other other things, but but certainly in food is medicine interventions. And so, you know, we basically just two 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 big picture things need to happen. One, the food system has to start actually paying for healthy food for patients who need it, just like it pays for drugs and devices and surgeries. Um, you know, there are some new anti-diabetic medications which cost ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars per year per patient. Um, they're approved, they're being paid for by insurances, um, they're perfectly fine medicines that, that we can be prescribing. If we're going to be paying 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars a year for a diabetic patient for one drug, we certainly should be paying for healthy food. And, and that would include things like produce prescription programs, medically tailored meals, and, and, and so on. I think the second big area is to actually educate the healthcare providers, the physicians, and all of the other allied healthcare providers. Um, and, and this is also not really rocket science. If, if there are many, many studies that have been published in the last decade that 80% or so of all training physicians and practicing physicians want to learn much, much more about nutrition and say that they're inadequately prepared. And so they want to learn more. And so the only thing that's stopping them is, is just the inertia of, of the current systems that say, oh, we're, there's too many things in our curriculum, we can't change the curriculum. 
All we have to do is change the tests and change the accreditation system. So every medical school, every residency program has to get accredited and every physician and you know, allied healthcare professionals has to get licensed by taking exams. If we just change the accreditation systems and the, and the exams so that you know, we say, look, the top cause of poor health in the world deserves 5% of your curriculum, 5% of questions on the test, 8% of questions on the test, 5% of what the accreditation requirements are, will change medical education overnight. And, and so I think that's also you know, very, very, very obvious. And, and then as an ancillary to that, you know, RDs who generally are very well trained, including some of our students who are RDs, um, are just not actually reimbursed for, for their work. And so there's actually very, very few diseases that you can write down as a doctor and get a, an RD, a, a dietitian consult paid for. And so we also need to just be sure that our RDs are being reimbursed for, for their work. So it's not rocket science. And, and, and these food as medicine interventions, I think, are crucial. Yeah, I didn't even realize that. Um, and it's so interesting. A friend of ours recently had a pacemaker put in and he's got all these heart issues. And I said, did you meet with a nutritionist? And he says, no. And I'm like, how can you have had a heart attack and have a pacemaker put in and they didn't immediately sit you down with a nutritionist? And I like gave him a stack of my books and I'm like, just start reading and cooking uh, this heart, stuff. Heart disease is not one of the conditions that's reimbursed by healthcare insurance for seeing a nutritionist, right? It's just kind of crazy. I, I gave crazy. a talk at a, at a major cardiology center um, in North Carolina and I spoke before to the director of preventative cardiology, which is a, a, a clinic focused mostly on blood lipids and blood lipid control. And, and she said that she'd been pleading with the hospital since she started years ago to get one nutritionist on staff. She said she had two geneticists on staff. So at the clinic, any patient that wants to see a geneticist, there's two geneticists on staff because that's reimbursed. But the hospital said, I'm sorry, we can't give you a nutritionist in the cardiology prevention clinic because it's not reimbursed. So, so you know, it's, 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 a, it's a crazy system, Katie. And, and I guess, you know, as a cardiologist, I think about healthcare, the analogy I, I like to use is, you know, healthcare, the healthcare system is like, you know, we're like firemen, right? We come in, the you know, the house is burning down, you call us, it could be a small fire, a big fire, and we do our best to put it out. Well, when the vast majority of Americans are sick, the vast majority of houses are burning down in this country, shouldn't we be investing in figuring out how to prevent the fires rather than just fire, more firemen? Right, and I think about our first presentation by Alex Drain, and you know, she's in a space where she's reflecting on all the fires, right? She's sort of one of those front of the line people, all these people dealing with all these fires, all the people caring for all the people with fires, uh, and how do we and do we deal with this? So it does have so many trickle down effects. The the last thing I want to hit on before we close is and it, it touches on the the heart of this conference. We had several questions around, you know, okay, so uh, my best friend came to me and said you got to follow this diet, or I just found this influencer on social media, and this influencer is amazing. How do I know? If this person is a con artist, how do I know if this person's peddling something real? Um, how do I know that this diet that my mom says I should go on is, is good? Um, there's a lot of influences out there in social media telling us the, the diet tribes, right? Telling us what to eat. And there are several questions on how do we detect, you know, fact from crap on this? Right. Well, the, the good news is that the, that this is the, one of the hottest topics in social media and on the internet and the news that, that people you know, seek out and try to get information on. So, so clearly the interest is there and that's good news. People are really hungry, you know, pun intended, to, to learn what to eat, to, to nourish themselves. You know, the bad news is that the vast majority of information is incomplete, um, not totally accurate or even, or even flatly wrong. And so this is a big challenge, you know, and, and this is one of the major reasons we were told when we did our strategic planning process five years ago that the Tufts Friedman School, as a source of credible, trusted information, has to take the lead in, in being that trusted source of knowledge. So how we do that, you know, we can't compete with, you know, one of the top, you know, media outlets in, in, in newspapers or other things. We can't be a direct-to-consumer communicator, right? We're not going to ever do that. So I think what we have to do is, is work with, um, you know, folks who, who then can communicate to the public. And so we need to work with policymakers. We need to work with the media. We need to work with, um, uh, you know, industry, communicate to them the best possible science. And then I think, of course, through our research and through our graduates, that they also, of course, 
have many, many, um, you know, a thousand points of light of contact, whether it's a community intervention in a low income neighborhood or a new company that's starting up. And, and so I think through our research and education, but also through our really direct, um, uh, a direct system for connecting with business, media, and industry, you know, we can be part of that solution to help clear up that mess of confusion. Because I'm confused. I'm confused. <laughs> this, is, this is all I study every day. So. I, I agree. You know, when I go to the doctor now, I always let them know that I work at Tufts at the Friedman School of Nutrition, just so they know they're, they're dealing with like someone who's going to want to talk about food and they just roll their eyes at me. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I love, Dari, that anytime we have this conversation, I'm, I'm always ready to be so angry. And you are so diffusing because you're so quick to say, let's be psyched that people are at the table and they're interested. So, so there's a fever pitch out there of, of people trying to find information. This is a good thing. And you're great about saying that the, the world of nutrition and all of us getting into this is still relatively new. This is, this is a new field. This is a new area, new passions for people. We have to let it breathe. We have to let it evolve. And we have to keep uh, uh, being the keepers of the information and pushing on the topics really hard and, and having conversations like we had like this today. So thank you so much for uh, running a great school and allowing us to have these kind of summits and being with us. Thank you, everybody. Five Tools Production in the back. Jim Sugarman, who did all the events work for us. All my team at Tufts, all of the moderators, all the panelists. Um, this has been fantastic. And thank you to all of you who joined us today. Uh, we couldn't be happier, right, Dari? Thank you for your leadership, Katie. Uh, a great event. And next year in person, we'll see everybody with live streaming for those who can join us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Mm -hmm.